Uh, as you is, is just, I'm going to try to go through a bunch of uh, slides here to give you guys some background on the AEC and where we're going to go in the next uh, next few meetings with this. All right. So what's very clear here is you should be very proud of ASEAN. It's one of the largest get-togethers of or a, whatever you want to call the AEC, uh, ASEAN the AEC. It is one of the largest economic communities formed since the EU. So this is very big precedent here. Something to, to, so people are talking about the um, the potential of this region, uh, and you know, yes, it has a lot of rough edges, but in comparison to the EU, it's uh, quite impressive. Okay, the first question is, what really is this AEC or this uh, this uh, this coming ASEAN Economic Community? Um, what I wanted to do is really is sort of give you guys a bigger perspective as to what it possibly is. And don't worry about writing this down. I'm going to give you the slides. So I'd rather have you guys just listen, okay? Um, or take some sort of notes. But you'll get this slide. Don't try to write each part out. What I've done here is I've gone from one, ang uh, one basic um, uh, unit to the most broad unit as possible. Autarky. Can I, does anyone know what autarky is? Okay, autarky is basically, think of a, a walled city with maybe uh, inside are both all the, um, or perhaps an island where everything is made and consumed on the same island. No trade with anyone else, okay? Consumption and uh, uh, production are done in the same place. You basically eat what you make, okay? No trade. That is... That happens, it doesn't happen very often anymore, but that's, that was, you know, sometimes the situation in many places. Um, it certainly isn't anymore. Uh, the next point is something called preferential uh, trade agreement. That's not a free trade agreement, but it's basically, people are saying within a group that uh, we will lower the tariffs down somewhat because you're our friends for some particular reason. We'll treat you differently than we treat everybody else, okay? Free trade agreement is the next one. That is going beyond the idea of preferential tariffs, but going to something along the lines of zero tariffs among its members, okay? Zero tariffs, that's the North American free trade agreement is essentially zero tariffs between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. The ASEAN is moving in that direction. You could say it's not necessarily a free trade agreement essentially yet, but it's, it's getting there. Um, What's a customs union compared to a free trade agreement? Do, you, do either of you guys know? It's the next level of integration. What is a custom? What, what distinguishes a customs union from a free trade agreement? And it's really only one thing. Let's say in a free trade agreement, let's imagine that the Philippines is in ASEAN with a free trade agreement and goods are coming into the United States and they have a 6% tariff, okay? The goods might come into Thailand from the United States at a 2% tariff, okay? The thing about a free trade, but, but the trade between the Philippines and Thailand is zero tariffs, right? So Thailand charges 2% on goods coming from the outside, Philippines charges 6% of goods from the outside. There's a difference between those two. The external tariff is different. A customs union, is them saying, if something is coming into our group, they will all charge the same tariff, a common tariff. Uniform. A uniform, com all right. So if it's, you know, it might be beef is different than chicken and different from television sets, but in Thailand, they charge the same tariff for that television set as they do in the Philippines. And it's a very important part of this whole process, and I'll get to that. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is the customs union is the free trade amongst themselves plus a common external tariff around the entire thing. Okay, that's a customs union. When you move to a common market, it's the essentially the trade and the, and the common external tariff plus if you want to work in one town, you can, uh, one country, you can go to the other country and not worry about it. And capital investment moves around. That's a common, essentially a common market. It's not just goods, but capital and labor that can move around. And that's a set of the EU for a long time was considered to be a common market. Okay? 
You can work in any of these places. You can invest in any of these countries, and the trade is moving around without any kind of uh, customs prices, and they charge the same thing. That's a common market. They call it, it used to be the European common market. An economic union is a common market plus a very strong institution in the center that essentially enforces the, ru the rules. And that's what the EU now is. It's the European Union. It's a union because they have lots of very strong central authorities where they, the central authorities do a lot of stuff on behalf of the members together. Okay? A good example is that the European EU has an EU level competition authority. ASEAN does not have an, an ASEAN, there's no ASEAN level competition authority. There's an experts group, then they meet and they talk about things. But there's no, ASEAN is going to, to uh, tackle, uh, tackle some sort of uh, anti-competitive practice between Thailand and the Philippines. It doesn't exist. So those instant, all we have is the ASEAN Secretariat, and it really doesn't do that much. It kind of just collects materials. So that's what distinguishes, so that's why you can't say that ASEAN right now is an economic uh, union. The next one, political union, which is probably the strongest, is perhaps you want to describe the United States. The U.S. is an example of both a common market and a political union at the same time. And it's, it's more integrated than, say, the EU. Okay? Um, the EU is a bunch of countries trying to make things work together. Oh, and I forgot currency union. Currency union is uh, the, when you've got an economic union and essentially you're all using the same currency. And that's what the EU right now is. Only just 10 years ago or so, the EU adopted the euro. You know, before 10 years ago, you still had to do your exchanges between Ger the German francs, sorry, the German marks and the French francs and the Italian lira. You had to do that 10, 10 years ago. That, that was all replaced by the euro and it made it a lot easier to trade and price things, and prices became very easy to see. In Germany, you could look at a compare a bottle of wine in Germany, you could compare it as a price in, in, in uh, France, and people could make do trading based on those differences. Um, and that's really nice. It's a good thing. And everyone said, wow, we're saving all this money in terms of uh, um, uh, thinking about uh, different prices and currency uh, exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. And it was good. But now they've gotten into a lot of trouble with what's going on in Greece. Greece is turning into a disaster because it can't devalue its currency, but it has a very inefficient economy. So if they can do it right, an economic currency union is very, very good. Um, and then I guess the last one is the political union, and that's the U.S. And, um, and, but though in some ways, economically, you could argue that the U.S. is more diverse than a place like the Philippines. The Philippines only has one corporate law, in the United States, you have 50 corporate laws, right? So, you know, it's, the United States is sort of an economic union, but it has its uh, glitches in that sense. All right, so I would say, I'm not going to ask you guys to necessarily put it, the, um, the ASEAN is someplace, is in the free trade agreement area right now. It doesn't have a customs union. It would be a nice idea if it did, but it does not have a common tariff. And it's moving towards some common market properties. So it's sort of skipping, the, it's going from a free trade agreement to a common market. And it's skipping the customs union right now. So what you might want to call this, what we're going towards with the uh, AEC, is what you'll find out is called a deep FTA. Some people call it a deep FTA. Free trade agreement with extra stuff. That's what we're basically moving towards with um, uh, as, um, the AEC. <laughs> okay, um, next slide, AEC fundamentals, the rise of the, I call the rise of the mega regionals. That's, the, there's a, there's been a, well you guys know what WTO is, right? WTO is supposed to be the worldwide organization to basically facilitate trade amongst countries, all right? There's been a lot of frustration with the WTO. But WTO is not the cool thing anymore. WTO is not the progressing institution. It's now regional 
trade agreements. We have ASEAN. We have something called the Pan-Pacific Partnership, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Have you heard of that? Have you heard that in the newspaper these days? The United States is trying to lead something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's trying to get basically all the Western, West Coast economies, Chile, Peru, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Singapore, Japan, Philippines maybe, Australia, all joining into a huge regional block centered on the Pacific. Okay? That is a mega regional. It's called the, the Trans, I believe it's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. All right. uh, and then on the other side, there's something called the TTIP, the Trans, uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And that is the same idea. The U.S. and the EU want, are negotiating something where they could free up all the, um, the barriers between them. So there's a lot of regional stuff going on. Big regional stuff. And ASEAN is one of those perhaps big three. There's probably three big ones. It's Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic, and ASEAN. And how that's all going to fit together is a big, big question. But the question that people are saying, why are we doing this? Why are we using WTO? And that's what's going on here, is um, WTO issues. WTO is stagnating. Their governance structure is allowing smaller uh, countries, uh, specific um, rules they want to follow to block the process. Um, what's another thing that some cynical people are saying is that developing countries are starting to push their clout, and the rich countries are starting to say, maybe we should go do our own thing. Which is, uh, some people would say, the e U.S. and the EU is a good example of that. Well, we'll set our own rules, because we're not, the WTO is not getting where we want to go. And we'll be able to get 80% of the world's trade just by doing it between us. And, yeah, so we look at the world with WTO, it doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? It's, um, it's a bit of a cynical interpretation, but some people say it. Um, at the same time, WTO, there's actually an article in the original treaty, it's Article 24 of the treaty, that basically says you can do regional trade agreements. And they've, just, they've just taken off while well, WTO is stagnant. So that's why I call it Rise of the Machines. There's a, a movie, Terminator, uh, Rise of the Machines. In some ways it's like that. It's this new, a new creature is coming on to usurp the old... Uh, way of doing things, and ASEAN is an example of that, or the AEC is an example of that. Okay, um, another thing that's very important here is that these mega regionals are built on geopolitical roots, just like ASEAN. ASEAN was a security, a, security, a political security group. They were trying to fight communism. With it. it wasn't supposed to be trade or uh, shared uh, investment. And um, these things are what's going on here is they're being defensive. People, uh, the people who are trying to push ASEAN or the leaders when they're thinking about things, oh shoot, now we have things happening with this Trans-Pacific Partnership. If we don't have a strong countervailing force, we're going to just get, we'll just get frozen out. So we have to put stuff together, we have to create our own regional thing in order to offset other powers regionally. So in some ways it's good, there's like a bit of a regional competition going on. In WTO, it was a monopoly of the entire world. And so people were able to uh, Stop it! Or they, it, it was, it was, it was just it, like a monopoly. It was starting to get fat and, and old, and uh, creaky, uh, not nimble. What's going on right now is you are having systems competing with each other. Just so you could say Microsoft and its system is competing, say, with Apple and its system, and they both better work really well. Or they're not going to come. They're not going to actually deliver what's necessary. So in some ways, what's going on here is. Uh, they are, these blocks are good in the sense that they are competing with each other and they're trying to come up with a more efficient system. And um, uh, perhaps the last reason here, when people think about WTO, they think, what are the benefits of WTO? Well, maybe I can buy something cheaper, but then we might lose our jobs, right? That's, that's, that's the always that was going on with this free trade. Um, here, you could say the supporters of a mega regional can see the business pattern that they can do. They're doing business in the region. People are doing business between 
say, Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, or maybe there's a value chain being developed between Thailand, the Philippines, and Japan. They can see these things in the region. As a result, they can more closely articulate the benefits of integration. Okay? And so that helps overcome some oftentimes very strong resistance to these types of trade agreements. And the other thing that's important here is that these regionals have potential to go deeper. WTO is just really about trading goods. The AEC is a lot more than just trading goods. Okay. Sure. Yes? Is, if I talk it right, is the interregional, other than mega regionals, a response to WTO? W or it is a design that after in WTO there must be bigger regionals? Or is this proud because of the unexpectedly? Not everyone expected this. Everyone thought when w, WTO had a great early start when it converted from something called GATT, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, to something called the World Trade Organization. And then there was the Uruguay round, and it went very well. And people thought, this is great. But then it's since then, it's stagnated. It's been stagnating for the last 10 years. If you read The Economist, you'll see every time there's a new round for WTO, oh, it's going to be great, great. Failure. Can't make their... Uh, can't have their agreements. France undermines another rule, or the, thir uh, the southern countries say we need this, and they just can't make agreements anymore. So what I'm trying to say here is WTO is failing, and these mega regionals are taking over. So this is an alternative? To a certain extent, yes. And people are a little afraid of it. They think it's going to go one of two ways. We're going to just go into uh, blocks, these big blocks, and it's all going to be determined by the powerful people within the blocs, like the US and the EU, and countries like the Philippines may not have as much rule of law protection. And, they, and people have been saying, people smarter than this than I, have been saying, they may look back on the WTO period between, before these regional, mega regionals, and say that the WTO period was the rule of law in international trade. And the new mega regionals are back to the old power politics kind of stuff. That's, we're going to get into this more. And you'll, these lectures, I don't make this stuff up. I'm just listening to all the lectures that you guys are going to hear. And this is what they're talking about. They're saying that we have, there was a period of time when it was all power blocks, and the U.S. had its area, the European, Europeans, or Germany had its area, and England had its area with its empire, and it called all the shots. And those blocks sort of got, to, you know, got along, but you know, not very well. And then we had WTO where everyone was sort of getting along, post-war, post-World War II economic order, and now that's breaking apart and we're going to this, back to the old block system, like before. Sir, um, I would just like, because I've not been doing it now for some time, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this Yale, what? this Asia block area, um, um, the nine oh yeah, okay. yes. Because uh, I, I have not been there for quite some time. Whatever happened to that? Because it was question. really very promising then. Yes. The development of uh, more on the Mindanao area, which has vast natural resources. Great question. Do you have any idea? Um, what I've heard, it, it, it started during the time of, of Ramos. Okay. The presidency of Ramos. But what I do heard, the succeeding presidents were not so as embracing. Uh -huh. So it died a natural death. I think it has died a natural death. That's a great question. What happened to Iaga in the shadow of ASEAN? And it's possible now with the AEC, it is going to be subsumed. It will just, it may have been the stake through the heart of Iaga. But that's a great question. And the question, my better question is, you know, you say it died because of lack of uh, interest. It, uh, it may have died because the rules initially were set up to fail. You know, uh, maybe everything was just written in such a uh, mumble-jumble way that you really couldn't do much. So um, there was no real commitment there. It was maybe just a paper thing that no one really in took fact, much advantage of. I read about the executive of Oracle, uh, okay. the editor of Microsoft, yes. invested in the but because of certain, 
don't you know. thought Iago would take off? No. Oh. After investing in uh, single words, he just left off. Mm. 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 Well, well, you know, it's, there's a lot of reasons why investors pull out of the Philippines. Yes. You know. It was really very promising. Though. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's try to move on because I do want to hit this before. Uh, okay. As I was saying, traditional tension between regionalism and multilateralism, which I was talking about, right? Um, okay, there's two things here that are, there's, there's, there's uh, I talked about this, this tension between these, these regional blocks and the multilateral blocks, but there's another economic reason why there's tension. And, and it's this guy here, Jacob Viner, that, um, who is a very leading um, expert in these things. It, these, it's gotten to the point that this guy, his last name becomes sort of a description of things. He'll say, well, this is a binarian approach to this problem. Or from a binarian perspective, this is, uh, this is a good thing or a bad thing. So this guy is, was so famous, like you know, in the 50s and the 60s, is that his name still rings true when they're talking about different things about international trade. Well, what I'm trying to say here is this guy basically came up with a big question. He's saying, to what extent do trade agreements create trade and what extent do they divert trade? And what the heck does that mean? And if you want to be a, you want to talk trade with people, you want to sound good at a cocktail party in the trade situation, you want to say, is this really trade creation or is it trade diversion? And if you can explain the difference between those two things, or know the difference between those two things in any cocktail party where people are talking about ASEAN, et cetera, et cetera, you'll, you'll, you'll really impress me. So, you know, I don't know if you really want to do that or not, but I found this to be something that was uh, an interesting distinction, and I'm going to talk about it now in a very simple way that I was able to help me understand it, and I think will help you guys understand it too. Because, again, I'm not an economist. He's saying here, trade creation. A country gains by switching from high-cost domestic producers to lower-cost foreign producers. We understand it. It's trade creation. So, you know, you get, now we get Starbucks, well, Starbucks coffee is maybe one example. Uh, let's say TV sets. If the Philippines had to make its own TV sets, it would be very bad. You did not have great TV sets. It's much better to have cheaper TV sets from Korea, right? That's, that's a good thing. Everyone now has a big TV, which is not everybody, but you can, you know, 10 years ago, you wanted to buy a big TV. Tens of thousands of dollars. Now you can buy one for 40,000 pesos, maybe less, you know, that kind of thing. Um, trade diversion. Because of an RTA or a custom union, buyers in a country switch imports from a, a lower cost non outsider to a higher cost insider. What the heck? Sorry, what does that mean? From a lower cost, sorry, there's a mistake. It's a lower cost non insider to a higher cost insider. And now we'll explain. This is my example. Very simple example. Trade creation. Here we have, we have orange, sorry, we have, uh, interesting how the colors change. We have orange country and blue country. Um, in orange country, we have, they can make, they can grow pineapples and bring them to the supermarket for $10 a pineapple, okay? Over in blue country, they can do it for $7, okay? But or surrounding each of these countries is a tariff barrier, and that's four bucks. Okay, so does it make sense if you're an ex, if you if you have a bunch of uh, pineapples lying around, and you have a friend in blue country, and you have a friend in um, uh, orange country? Do you say, do we do business? Yes or no? Does it make sense to bring pineapples from blue country over to uh, orange country? at this point, before the TA. No. no, you can't, you'll lose money. You'll just lose money. Because you're gonna pay seven plus four, you basically have an $11 pineapple competing with $10 pineapples, right? Okay, what happens after the TA? Makes sense, yes. right? I'm, I remember, no transport costs, okay? So, it clearly, blue is a, uh, a nice place to be. They can put pineapples over into their they, assuming no tri transfer costs, they, it makes a lot of sense to, to load up a ship with pineapples and bring them over 
thing once this barrier broke down. It's not good for the domestic producers in orange. But maybe orange country, can, they can grow oranges. Who knows? It's something else. That's how it's supposed to work. Let's, I'm, I'm, let's leave aside what happens to the poor pineapple growers in orange country. But for overall, people now get pineapples cheaper. And economists say, regardless of the allocative issues, whether group A does better or group B does better, overall, there's better. Okay? What happens when the pie is bigger? How you cut the pie up? Another issue. That's hard, a hard issue. But economists like bigger pies. And they're going to say the pie is bigger after the trade. But what happens now? What if suddenly we stick this country right in the middle? All right? So, uh, before the trade agreement, you got your friend in green country. Uh, let's imagine that uh, Francis is in green country and uh, Walter is in orange country. Do you guys do business? Does Francis, do you sell to Walter? Francis is in green country wearing a green shirt. Do you sell to Walter in orange country? Yes or no? Makes sense to sell? Even with a trade, with no, even with a tariff barrier, it kind of, what, makes sense, right? Yes. Because it only costs you five, you got, you, you've got to pay off customs four, and you've got a, now a very nice competitive product. Maybe, um, maybe in the country they'll bring the price down a bit, who knows, but right now there's a business opportunity right there. Okay? There's a business opportunity for someone in green, in green country to load up a ship, bring over to, um, to Orange. What happens if after, uh, after the, um, the trade agreement between uh, blue and orange goes into effect? Does it make sense anymore? Blue and orange, and after, so notice, after TA, there's no longer a ring around, uh, the $4 ring around blue and orange is gone. But, because there's, uh, green is not part of this trade agreement. What, does the deal before make sense anymore? Remember the deal, it was a nice deal to uh, load up a ship in green and bring it over to orange. Is that still a good deal or no? Would you be excited? Between, would you guys still be doing business? If you're in green, wearing a green shirt, and you're in orange, are you guys going to do business? Are you going to buy from him? Are you going to... Walter, will you buy from your friend in green anymore? Yes or no? You're in orange. And a trade agreement's been established between blue and orange. Under the, the lower one. Are you going to buy from green? Why? Maybe I will buy in green. Hmm? I'm asking here, are you going to buy from your friend in green? So clearly, you had this friend in green country who was selling you pineapples before the trade agreement. Now the trade agreement between orange and blue has gone into effect. You live in orange. Do you continue to import the pineapples from green? Under this deal? No. No. Why? Because price is higher after the trade agreement. The price has gone up? For whose, whose prices have gone up? This price is still the same. It's still $5. In fact, it's cheaper than, uh, than blue. He's a better producer than blue. He said, my pineapples are better. My system, we're, too much, we're much more efficient. Are you still going to buy from him? So, so how much does that pay to US dollars? Hmm? That's the cost of producing. The cost of producing. That's, 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 how, yeah. that's what it costs to get a pineapple from the field to the store in orange. And then when I import from. Will you import from green? Before you would, under the TA, before. Before. You would. It would make sense. You can go ahead and go to. You'll get to a. Uh, essentially to a supermarket paying only nine dollars of cost okay and you're, you're cheaper than the uh, competition than the domestic competition now after the TA 
Fra Francis's prices have not changed. Are you still going to do business with Francis? It has not changed. His price has not changed. Will you do business with Francis? After the trade agreement. Yes. Why not go to Blue? Look at Blue. Who's cheaper now? The Blue. Blue is cheaper. Exactly. Suddenly, Blue is much more, Blue's inferior pineapples are more competitive than green. Okay. Now, if you're really smart, what you do is you figure out a way to um, get into, say, uh, um, let's see, could you do something? What, what people do under these circumstances, they try to get their way in one way or another into the other country and then bring it across. So they get, they get the benefit of the free trade. And uh, someone's going to try to sneak their pineapples in to... Uh, to blue, and then move them over to, uh, no, what you do is here, you go, nine. What's going to happen here is, um, what's going to happen here, people who are not pineapple farmers in blue will go ahead and buy pineapples from green, put them on a ship, park them for a day in the harbor of blue, and go across over to orange. Why would you do that? Because it costs five, you pay the four, it's nine, nine beats 10. Oh, but then there's a problem, then you have to compete with seven. You have to compete with seven, that's right. So, sorry, it was not gonna, it's not gonna work that well. But if, uh, say, if, um, if, uh, if for some reason pineapple rice went up in blue, it could be, that would be as perhaps a solution. All right, so you're getting, am I, is this helping or hurting you in terms of trying to understand this, this idea of trade creation and trade diversion? Practically, sir. I made you more confused. I have personal knowledge of what you said. Your example of the green park safety blue. No, no, I'm not going to, are you having an example of that happening? Yes. Okay. Let me say, that I, I, I want to, but let's, let's back up there. Now, I was going too far there. Let's just say, what I'm trying to say, the only point I'm trying to make here is that when you have a free trade agreement between orange and blue, suddenly somebody who's outside the, the, the ring is getting frozen out. And that's called trade diversion, not necessarily trade creation. That's a distortion caused by a regional trade agreement or a limited trade agreement. And that's called, that's, they say that is not necessarily good for the people in orange uh, or the people in blue because of this trade agreement. You know, everyone used to say that trade agreements are good things, but not necessarily. And this is what this guy, um, uh, Jacob Viner, was able to explain in much more complicated uh, formulas. Okay. Uh, but then multi WTO solves the problem. If we have a, uh, a global TA, and all, let's say before that, uh, the, 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 bottom, the bottom one is the problem. Here, the top one is just the, the same thing as the bottom one of the previous. If we get rid of all the barriers, then there's no problem. Everyone's going to buy from green, right? After the global TA, there's no problem. Uh, well, it's not great for the domestic consumer, the domestic producers in orange and blue. Green is going to clean up under global. But at least we're not getting, at least then we're getting the pies very big, people are getting good pineapples, the pineapple growers in orange or blue are getting, they have to figure out, they have to adjust, but overall consumer uh, pounds say this is a better thing. And so that's what we're saying, what I'm trying to explain here is that one of the tensions between regionalism and WTOism or multilateralism is that you don't have to worry about these distortions. If there's no barriers anywhere, then you don't have to worry about these kinds of uh, um, diversions of trade. Okay, so that is um, that is uh, how should we say? People, when we're talking about this this regionalism that's growing here, it's not just this uh, notion of power or whether it's nice or not. It makes things more complicated. 
It complicates things. It creates distortions. It it um, it moves pro uh, products around in ways that if they kind of, if it was totally free, it wouldn't be okay. So that's maybe a cost of the regionalism we're moving towards. Okay. Now, this is probably one of the last uh, slides that we're going to talk about, and maybe this will be the last slide since it's late. <clears throat> and you're going to get this again, but I want to throw it at you now. There is a, uh, a guy named Richard Baldwin. He works in Geneva. Very smart guy. Very well spoken. Writes great articles. He is into the same... He's, his basic uh, thinking these days is that there's a huge shift in the way deals are done and trade moves around. And there used to be the old way and there's the new way. And he calls it 20th century and 21st century. And I'm just, this is just a preview. You'll get more of this, not the next class, but the class after that. Um, but let's just try to go through it right now. This is, again, this is AEC fundamentals. This is one of the things, that we're not trying to get deep yet, but we're gonna, I wanna just talk about it. In the 20th century, basically, you have, in the United States, you have Detroit. They're all clustered, they're making cars, and they're selling cars overseas. In the new era, what do you have? Breaks, being made, breaks are being made in the United States, in, in the Philippines. The car, the car body is being made in Thailand, and it's all being assembled in Taiwan, and it's going up to Japan, or going out of out of Taiwan and going to the rest of the world. What's going on is, as they describe it here, the val um, supply chains from you know getting the metal to fashioning into a car to putting the engine in is being done all over the place. It used to be done in one place, and then you just, all you have to worry about, the trade part is the only thing about selling. Trade now is about, as they say it here, you make everything everywhere. It used to be made here, sold there. It's now make everywhere. The whole process of making things is now part of the world trade system. Well, it used to be before. The whole process of selling was the World Trade System. Making had nothing to do with the World Trade System. You used to make stuff in one place and you sell it everywhere else. You now essentially make stuff in different places, assemble it at one final spot and then sell it. Okay, so as you see here, if you are, um, if you wanna be, if the Philippines, for instance, wants to industrialize the old way, build a supply chain, build a, a steel manufacturing uh, plant, a steel plant, and then build a time a, a, a tool making plant, and then build your car. That's that's the old way of doing things. Now it is be part of the supply chain. Um, uh, what he says here, main catalyst for this whole process in the old way, the steam revolution. He says this is steam revolution essentially allowed stuff to move on boats from here to there very cheaply, okay? The, I, the information technology revolution allowed coordination at a level that was never already done. You can have a Skype conversation with your supplier in Thailand and you can work it all out. You have a computer, you have a joint plan and you know, everyone puts their, their, their schedules in. You couldn't do that 10, 15 years ago. Now you can. It's made it a lot easier to have joint production. Totally different situation than it was even 20 years ago. And so what he's saying here now, the bargaining that went on in international trade, last line here, which I think is very nice, and this guy has li these nice little uh, market, uh, nice little um, concepts. It used to be, I'll trade my market for your market. You open up your barriers to entry, or you, you lower your trade, your, your uh, tariffs, I'll lower my tariffs, Stuff can go from my place, I can now go to your, get your consumers, you can get my consumers. And wherever it works out, great. So you're trading markets back. Now it's instead this. You're now trading, the bargain is, factories for reforms. Philippines or say, Laos or Cambodia. You come in, Laos foreign investors, lots of protection. And guess what? You, you show that that's a really strong thing. You come up with really good governance and make that happen. And we will come, and we will be there, and we will uh, 
start building stuff. And that's, that's the idea here is we're going to trade factories for credible reform. That's the new, that's the new paradigm. So that is why you see in the ASEAN economic community, it's not just about trade. It's about this whole investment thing. And next time we meet, we're going to talk about trade. We're going to talk about something called ATIGA. Have you heard of ATIGA? ATIGA is the treaty. The, uh, it's called the ASEAN Trade in Goods Act. No, ASEAN Trade. Let's go do it. Uh, it's called. My voice is going. Where is it? I know it's um, the the ASEAN Trade and Goods Agreement that was signed in 2010. You know, when you think about it, what is, from a legal point of view, what really drives the AEC is not the charter, it's not the, something called the blueprint, it's these treaties. And there's two treaties we're going to focus on in the next two weeks, or the next two meetings. First one is something called the TIGA, the ASEAN Trade and Goods Agreement. And the other one we're going to focus on is something called ASEA, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement. Now that is right, that one is right, uh, where is it, ASEAN? The ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, there it is. Pen, right there. So it's ASEA, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, and ATIGA, the ASEAN Trade and Goods Agreement. Those are the two things that are going to drive the process in the, um, in the coming years. And as lawyers, we should know what the, tre the, the, the treaties say, or these agreements say. And so when we, when we next meet, we'll first talk about ATIGA. And I will talk about, and you'll see when I send you out the readings, it's going to have to be very fast, so we're meeting... Uh, Again, in a couple of weeks, right? Two weeks from now? Yes, sir. I will get the materials out to you very fast. Um, I will let you, I'm going to, well, the first thing I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you the, the Atiga itself. You'll see a copy of that. And, um, and we'll be talking about issues that deal with sort of the 20th century tra old fashioned trading goods. A lot of those things is what we'll talk about the next time. And the time after that, we'll be talking about ASEA, the ASEAN Comprehensive Trade uh, Investment Agreement. And that's the 21st century part of the thing. So, um, so just to repeat, next time we meet, it's going to be talking about trading goods. The time after that, it's going to be the deepening part of the free trade agreement, the deeper part. All right, my voice is shot. Uh, we have a few more things maybe to talk about. I'm going to, my job for the next day or so is to get up the next materials for you guys to read. Um, and I will do that. And it won't, since you have only a couple of weeks, it won't be as much as uh, it was last time. But the time after that will be more because there's a longer period. Yes, okay. All right, so we're done. Thanks, you guys. Um, we're already five minutes past. Sorry for being late today. Um, but we'll stop there. Thanks. Sir, yes? I got to go past some point of clarification. Uh, the, the, the principles or where our subject comes from, specifically competition, it's not on the economic and financial point of view. Or is it more on how law neutralizes competition? Or, or wow. Um, okay. The frame of reference okay. Perspective. Overall so, philosophy and perspective of this course, which is, emer is as I said, this is the first time I've taught it, um, and it's emerging. But the thing it's trying to say, from my opinion, consumer is king. The consumer is the most important person in my mind right now in this course. And what I'm saying here is consumers benefit from two things. 
One, a good competition policy, uh, a strong competition policy uh, with, with people enforcing it who know what they're doing. Um, but the second side of it, the consumer benefits not from a good competition policy. Not necessarily, no, they do, but in addition to a good competition policy, the lowering of barriers, the globalization, the integration, the widening of the market, the greater choices that come from globalization. And I'm not saying whether that's good for workers or not at all, but I'm just thinking of the consumers. Consumers are better off when they have more choices. There's two ways to have to do that. You can have strong competition within your own economy, and you have a good competition agency that enforces that, but also you can bring in the rest of the world, and the rest of the world means more choice. You see what I'm saying? Yes. That's why these two things, are. I'm trying to tie them together. I'm trying to tie together the integration that's going on in the ASEAN thing with the concept of competition and competition policy. So what we did is we started with competition policy. I, I maybe could have given you a, a better, well, I gave you what I gave you. And we then moved on to the ASEAN side of things. And then at the end, we're going to come back to competition. Okay, thanks guys.